pull up the call to worship. So, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to worship uh, for St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church on this Sunday, uh, June the 28th. Uh, summer has has fully come upon us. Uh, it's been uh, some beautiful weather this past week, if uh, starting to get a little bit warm. But uh, certainly, we uh, we're glad to be coming into this new season. Uh, again, also as, as things are, are opening up and the situation, at least here in Canada, uh, continues to improve. So let's, uh, let's start our time of worship today uh, with our call to worship, uh, which is taking, uh, taken from Psalm 119, verses 1 to 8. Happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are those who keep his decrees, who seek him with their whole heart who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous ordinances. I will observe your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. All right, now we're going to go over to uh, to Melody. Uh, just give me one second to flip the camera. And change over the microphone. All right. Go ahead, Melody. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning we're going to sing together Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. And I believe you have the lyrics with you there at home. So I invite you to sing with me as we lift our praise to the Lord. readings this morning, uh, but before that, we'll, let's, uh, let's take a moment to pray. Father, we thank you 
for this day. We praise you for you are our Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. And we, we praise you for each new day that comes to us. We thank you that we can continue to worship you this morning, again, in our separate homes, uh, yet united by your Spirit. And we praise you and bless you that you are the God who comes to us, wherever we are, no matter what our circumstances, to offer us your peace, your strength, your joy, and all the goodness that comes through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yet as we come to you, Lord, we must confess that too often we have kept our faith to ourselves, that we have not lifted our our voices at home or away, and and indeed too often we have forgotten you, either uh, in our minds or forgotten you by what we do that does not reflect who you are. We pray that you would forgive us our sins, renew us by your Spirit, that our lives would pour forth your praise in every day, every place, every time, both home and away. We pray all this in and through your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, our first, uh, our first scripture reading today comes from uh, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. Uh, and this is from Moses' uh, final words to the people of Israel uh, before he, he was to die and pass on leadership to another. Uh, so in chapter 6, we, we come to uh, some very important words. For, for God's people. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy, so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and commandments that I am commanding you, so that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently, so that it may go well with you, and so that you may multiply greatly in the lands flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Our gospel reading today comes from the gospel of Matthew. Chapter 9, verses 9 to 13. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors? And sinners. On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. And this is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. All right. Well, as I said at the at the outset. Uh, it's been another week of, of generally good and encouraging news uh, here in Ontario uh, and through Canada overall about our progress in, in rolling back the COVID-19 pandemic. We're just over a week into stage two of the reopening plans here in Ontario uh, and particularly here in the city of Hamilton. And the average rate of new infections in the province has been less uh, than 200 a day. Hospitalizations continue to drop, as do the number of hospital patients who are severely ill. Still, uh, we are reminded of the ongoing need to be cautious and vigilant. We need only look across the border to the United States, where many states to the south and west of of America are experiencing skyrocketing uh, and 
growth in new infections uh, due to government reopening plans that have moved too quickly and without enough precautions, as well as individuals who have prized their individual freedom over the well-being of their neighbours. And just within the last few days here uh, in, in Ontario, in Kingston, uh, we've been reminded how quickly and widely an outbreak uh, can spread. 16 people contracted COVID from a salon and nearly 700 people have been told to isolate and get tested. On the one, it's, it's, it's a challenging news, but it's, all, it's good news in the sense that public health in Kingston is doing their job and has traced down all the contacts of these 16 people. But as Elaine can, can tell you from her role uh, on the pandemic team here with Hamilton Public Health, uh, it's a lot of work under a tight timeline when these things happen. The resources are there, but we, we can need to continue to be careful because it is a lot of work when one of these things happens. So God has been good overall. Uh, God, indeed, God is always good. Um, and most of us have pulled together as fellow citizens here in Canada to do our part and make the sacrifices necessary to contain and reverse the, pros the, the, the progress of this pandemic. But we need to continue to be wise, to avoid unnecessary risk, and take great care to protect the more vulnerable uh, members of our community. And this is why Session has, has decided to wait to September to return uh, to in-person worship services. We need time to prepare uh, and to put in place all the necessary safety procedures and to make sure that the public health situation is stable before we gather together again. And from the initial responses to the survey that we sent out a week ago, it looks like most of you agree with this approach. That said, I recognize that having to continue to worship in this way is, is difficult and, and far from ideal. Making the decision to cancel our worship gatherings back in March was one of the hardest decisions I, I've had to do, make in ministry. Uh, even as I knew that we as a church, as a session, had, had no other choice. And going through Holy Week, Easter, and the last few months of worshiping together in spirit, but physically apart in our homes, has at times been painful, especially through those holidays. When this started, and particularly around Easter, I would have thought that I would have been among those wanting to reopen for in-person worship as soon as possible. But as time has stretched on and the situation has developed, and as I've prayed and thought things through, I can say that nothing is more important than the safety of our church family and those among our neighbors who we hope might come to know, worship, and love God through our church. As essential as the gathered community is to following Jesus, to sustaining faith and carrying out the mission of God's kingdom, this extraordinary time has reminded me that our God can be worshipped anywhere, under any circumstances. And I've also, in this time, been trying to listen to what God might be trying to teach us through this trial. And I believe that one thing he is hoping that we can take to heart is that we are called to love and serve him every hour of the week, not just the one or two we spend gathered together in a church building. The hour or two we spend in worship and in the full community of the church is absolutely critical to being able to love, honor, and serve God the rest of the week. But the witness of the Bible is that the best measure of our faith and faithfulness to our God is what we do when we leave the house of prayer and return to our homes and daily lives. Indeed, in Deuteronomy 6, one of the most important passages in the Old Testament, we are reminded of the importance of taking our worship and practice of faith home. Uh, verses 4 and 5 are the central statement of faith for the people of Israel, which is called the Shema, after its first word in Hebrew. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This teaching is also central for us as Christians, as Jesus affirmed and expanded this with the command to love our neighbors as ourselves from Leviticus 19. These are, are the most familiar words in our reading today, but it's, it's important to look at the full passage to see how we are called to put them into practice. And there we have these, these additional instructions. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. 
recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Down the centuries, observant uh, and devout Jewish people have taken these words literally. Observant Jews write recite the words of the Shema to start and end every day. They also post them on the doorposts of their houses. If you have any Jewish friends or neighbors, uh, look for a little rectangular box, it's usually on an angle, on their on their door jam the next time you go to visit. This is called a mezuzah, and it contains a tiny piece of parchment with the words of Deuteronomy 6, as well as some corresponding words from Deuteronomy 11. And many... Again, many observant Jews will take time to pray briefly as they go out and as they come in. Now, the, these kind of things can become rote practices, if not done mindfully and intentionally, but they can provide a structure to keep f- faith a practice rooted at home. This is something we've seen, we, we can see in the fact that all the most of the Jewish festivals, the, including the central celebration of Passover, are practiced at home. Yes, they also go to synagogue to gather with the full community, but the practice of faith and worship of God begins at home, and it has since the time of Moses. Now, at different times and places, Christians have practiced their faith in similar ways. This was certainly true back in the 19th century when St. Andrew's was founded. Books were expensive, and most families would only have one Bible, a large Bible that they would read together as part of regular family devotions as well as private study. And these devotions, perhaps joined by a few neighboring families, will be the only option for worship in the early days of settlement in in our area. Before a church building could be put up, people would have to worship at home most weeks. Only gathering in a larger community at a barn, a clearing, or a schoolhouse when a preacher rode through on horseback every couple of months. This home-based practice of the faith continued for a long time in many ways, Yet we did start to see a breakdown in in the 20th century, in part due to many good developments. Learning in general moved out of the house as public schools became available to everyone. And the same trend occurred as churches expanded their facilities after the Second World War. Churches built more dedicated Sunday school spaces, and more and more programs were offered to both children and adults. Worship and learning and other practices of faith moved more and more into the church building. But as a consequence, faith could easily become sequestered and sealed off from the rest of life. Church was something we did in one particular building, once or twice a week. But there was another opposite trend as well. The practice of faith became, I think, more private and individual. Books became cheaper and more available. Everyone was able to have their own Bible, prayer books, devotional guides, and other resources. Increasingly, faith, devotion, and spiritual practice became an individual activity. And this has only increased with personal mobile devices where everyone in the house can read and watch and do their own thing on their own time and in their own room. Well, some have maintained family faith practices, uh, even in very devout and committed Christian families, private individual practice has become more the norm. Uh, This was the case for me growing up. My my parents each had their own prayer and devotional lives and were intentional about teaching me to do the same. But other than saying grace at meals, we, we usually only had family prayer or family faith practices around Christmas and Easter, like we did an advent calendar every year. Um, or we, we get together and pray when there was a crisis. Yes, we often talk together about how faith affected life around the kitchen table, but both my parents were, were in ministry, and for that reason, I think this came much more easily for us than it did for many other, for many other families. Now, this should not take away the importance of community worship, learning and practice as a whole church or in smaller groups. It also shouldn't take away from the individual private practice of faith. Yet for many reasons, and again, some of them coming as unintended consequences of otherwise good developments, the open and shared practice of faith at home tended to get squeezed out between community practice in the church building and private practice in one's own room. For many of us, this has led to a a compartmentalizing our faith 
into something we practice primarily in two places, at, at the church building and in our private room. And I think this has, has contributed to the difficulty we've had in passing on the faith to others. Faith that's outsourced to the church building and practiced in private has made passing faith along in families more difficult. Throughout my life, I, I, I've listened to so many deeply, deeply devout people grieve the fact that they haven't been able to pass their faith on to their own children. Yet I've noticed in these stories that these same devout people didn't know how to talk about faith at home, something that happened, again, earlier and then has, has tailed off. They, they put so much effort in, into making sure that they brought their kids to Sunday school and quietly living a good example for their kids at home, but they don't know how to talk about it more broadly. Again, this is not every family, uh, but it's something that, that, that I've noticed, uh, and it's a struggle even for those of us who are trying to be intentional about practicing faith at home. And this same situation of faith centered on the church building and, and the private room has made, I think, faith sharing more difficult in other areas of life. Uh, whether you have, share your home with others or, or, or live on your own. When, when church is something primarily done in your own room and in a special building, it can make it hard to talk about it with others, like including, such as your neighbors, the people you live closest to at home. You quietly, I know I do this so often, quietly get in the car on a Sunday morning when they're still in their pajamas or in bed and perhaps wave to them if they're outside when you come home at lunchtime. But when it's something that you don't talk about much outside of Sunday morning, even within your own family, or as much as you try to, you sure are going to find it difficult to talk openly about it with your neighbors or your coworkers or your friends. Now, I'm talking about a lot of broad uh, generalizations here. Um, everyone's situation is different, and, and I know this is something that we, I know I struggle with uh, 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 even in ministry. Um, and many people have continued to practice their faith openly, intentionally with, within their home, family, in their neighborhood, and everywhere else they live, the 167 other hours when they're not in the church building. But my experience is that on average, our practice of faith at home, even for those of us who are devout and intentional, is much less than among Christians in many other times and places. But this is where we may find blessing, I think, in this challenging time. We have been forced to take our worship and our practice of faith home. Our living rooms, our family rooms, and other communal spaces in our homes have now become places of worship. And this can open the door to us extending out beyond the, the, the hour of worship on Sunday morning or whenever you're worshiping this week. It can move us this time, I think, can move us into other home-based faith practices. One couple I, I've talked to uh, in this time told me that though they both have developed uh, a strong private prayer practices over the years, they'd never really prayed together on any kind of regular basis. But this pandemic ha has opened the door to doing this, and it's been very rewarding for them. I know for myself, so often prayer is a part of my work routine. I come to the church, I pray in, in the morning, and that, but that's made it hard for me on my days off. I, I, I confess for the longest time it was always a struggle to remember to pray first thing in the morning on, on a Monday, and often I didn't. Um, but when I'm working from home, when it's something that I do at home now most of the time, it's made it easier, and even just... Say, I can say to the kids, guys, I'm going upstairs to pray. They know that this is something that I do every day. Um, something that my, I, I noticed from my father growing up. These are, again, little things that bring that more at home. Uh, other encouraging things that I've been hearing about is how many of you have been calling one another to offer mutual support and encouragement. When I talk to someone on the phone, I usually ask in some way who they've been talking to. At first, this was just to make sure we weren't missing out on any needs within our community. But then it was to learn and just be encouraged at how strong our network of care is as a congregation here at St. Andrews. And though the elders and the pastoral care team and I have been making, making calls, what has been most essential in this time, I think, has been the way that all of you have been reaching out to one another and caring for one another as a spiritual practice rooted in your own home. 
This pandemic has required us to do many of the things that we would normally do at the church building at home, whether that's worship, prayer, fellowship, pastoral care. And I hope this is something that will continue as we return to worshiping and gathering in our church building. Because the more we practice our faith at home, openly and outside our, our private spaces, the more we'll be able to grow our faith and share it with others. Both those we share our homes with, but also those we live beside in our neighborhoods and in the places where we live our daily lives. Let's hear those words from Moses again as we wrap up today. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away. When you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. And write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. May we do this today and grow into this as we go into tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to swap over to Melody again. We're going to sing one final song together, 10,000 Reasons. It, uh, it's one of my favorite worship songs. I hope it's one of yours as well. And uh, let's bless the Lord with this song.
humility. Let's, uh, let's close our, our time of worship just with, uh, with a short word of prayer. Oh, Lord God, we thank you that you are the God who calls us to be a part of your family, that indeed you come to be with us and where you are is home. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're the one who makes this happen. And by your spirit, you're with us no matter where we go. Lord, we pray for this world for which you came. We pray for all those uh, dealing either directly with uh, this coronavirus pandemic or, all, or who are affected by it negatively, those who are feeling isolated, those who have lost jobs, those who now, but we, who now have hope. We pray that we would all take care, be vigilant, be cautious, and be mindful of one another as we move out. And Lord, most of may this be characteristic of we who follow you, that we would love our neighbors as we love ourselves. We pray for our, our church family here at St. Andrews. Continue to, to draw us together by your spirit. Help us to reach out and care for one another. We pray for those who, whose needs have been shared with us. We continue to pray for, for Eric and for Eleanor. We continue to pray uh, for Bill and Donna. We pray, Lord, uh, for, for so many others in, in our church family whose needs have been shared with us. And uh, in this time, Lord, help us to draw on you, your healing, your peace, your strength. We pray all these things in and through your name, Lord Jesus, and pray further as you have taught us. Our Father, who art, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, we'll see you again uh, for worship next Sunday, which will be the first Sunday in July. We'll be uh, worshiping by, by Zoom video conference again because it's a communion Sunday. So again, uh, if you haven't already done so, add, add some juice and bread to your grocery list and we will we'll break bread together uh, in our homes. So until then, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and remain on each one of you, both now and forever. Amen. All right, everyone, take care. God bless. Be well. See you again soon.